I would like to uh, recognize certain former colleagues of mine, Canadian Foreign Service officers, uh, Ambassador Paul Durand, um, Ambassador Dean Brown, I see at the back, Percy Abels, Ambassador Robert, Robert Colette, um, Ambassador Chris Westall, and I'm also happy to welcome uh, representatives of the Government of Canada, especially the Federal Commissioner of Lobbying, Karen Shepard, um, and uh, a Karen from the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, members of the University of Ottawa, Carleton University, as well as the private sector. And now it's my pleasure to ask the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, Dr. Dane Rollins, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Larry, and as always, uh, I'd like to give my thanks to Larry for organizing these on behalf of uh, Carleton University. Uh, so on behalf of Carleton University, the Office of the Vice President of Research International, Carleton International, and the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, I'm very happy to welcome you all here today and very pleased to have with us the uh, Ambassador uh, from Mexico. So I won't... I won't do any of this in Spanish, since all I can do in Spanish, I think, is order two beers. <laughs> so I will. Uh, uh, Ambassador Francisco Suarez uh, Davia graduated in law from the National University of Mexico City and earned a Master's of Law from King's College at the University of Cambridge. Early in his career, between 1972 and 1992, he served at the Bank of Mexico as General Manager of International Economic Affairs. And he continued in that financial role as Executive Director of the IMF. Uh, financial Director of Mexico's Industrial Development Bank, Nacional Financiera, and Undersecretary of Finance and Public Credit, and Director General of the Banco Mexicano, SOMEX, now Banco Santander. Ambassador Suarez also served as a federal congressman from 1994 to 1997, during which time he was Chair of the Finance Committee. And in 1997, Ambassador Suarez was named Ambassador of Mexico to the OECD, where he remained until 2000. Prior to his appointment uh, as Mexican Ambassador to Canada, uh, Ambassador Suarez served as the Secretary General of the Colosio Foundation, the think tank of the President, uh, of President Peña Nieto's PRI party, and Vice President of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations. Please welcome uh, the Ambassador of Mexico, His Excellency. Uh, thank you very much for Director Dane, Dane Rollins for his uh, uh, kind uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, it is a pleasure to have been invited by my friend uh, Larry Leatherman to this very prestigious uh, Ambassador Speaker Series at the Norman Patterson School. Uh, I, I come here with a bit of hesitation because I'm getting a very bad name. I arrived in Mexico last Monday and uh, uh, the day after there was the coldest day in the in the recent history of Mexico City, we reached you know like minus one temperature, and now I come here in the middle of a hurricane. So you know, I, I think I'm not going to be. Uh, well, the other thing I would like to say, uh, I really feel very much at ease in an academic uh, uh, community. I've been uh, at probably more more often as, as uh, in academic uh, activities as I've been in the in the Mexican civil service. And, and I really enjoyed it because it's one time in which I can say absolutely what I want. Sometimes I, my, my colleagues say, you know, remember, you're an ambassador, you're not an academic anymore. You have to be, there are some things that you, should, you shouldn't say. And, and, and my wife was the other one who would say, you know, be careful, you're, you're a, a diplomat. But uh, here I will say, in the questions and answers, don't, I will say uh, uh, things, uh, uh, you know, not in the usual diplomatic way. Um, what I will be dealing with is first I will refer to some basic features of Mexico's place in the world with a certain amount of historical perspective. Secondly, I will comment to you on the transformations that are currently taking place in Mexico, which are, are very important, and uh, particularly these transformations as they relate uh, to the future and to the relationship between Canada and, and Mexico. Uh, for, for us, next year is a very special year because it will be 70 years of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Canada and Mexico. It will be uh, 20, years of, uh, uh, 20 years of the establishment of, of a North American Free Trade Treaty. Uh, it's something like the 30th year of the Agricultural Workers Program. It's been working very well between Canada and Mexico. I was just reminded, I just came back from Mexico yesterday with a, a binational parliamentary delegation. I was reminded that it will also be the 15th time that, that the both legislations meet. So it's a, it's a very special, a special way and, and I will address it. Uh, in my first part, part, I think Mexico's place in the world, I will try, although briefly, to, ad to address many myths 
uh, stereotypes and misconceptions uh, uh, on, 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 on Mexico and, and, and Mexicans. Uh, the first thing that one normally tries to clarify is that Mexico is in North America, not Central America. That is why we signed a North American Free Trade Treaty. Of course, we are part of Latin America in the, in the cultural sense, and we're, as you know, the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. Uh, we certainly want to go beyond the stereotype of a country, uh, and that I will very much mention as part of a, uh, a campaign here that, you know, uh, Canadians go to Mexico in large numbers, but they normally seek uh, sun, sand, and margaritas. So I think we'd want to try to convince Canadians that, you know, uh, you don't have museums in the beaches. I think you should go to the, to the central part of Mexico where I think there's a lot of, a lot of culture. And that all, uh, I, I normally emphasize that Mexico no longer sleep uh, siesta, no longer wear sombreros. And I think that's, you know, we're changing stereotypes. Um, I, will I will later deal with a, with a negative uh, image that we're having, that's the violence and the drug cartels. I will, de I will deal with it. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, the, the, f the basic fact is Canadians do not know enough about Mexico and Canadian, and me Canadians do not know enough about Mexico and, can and, and Mexicans do not know enough about, about Canada. And it's really stupidity and we have to work on that. Uh, as you know, Mexico is the 11th largest economy in the world. If you measure it by what the economists call purchasing power of the, of the currency, uh, we're about the same as Canada or Italy, right in that group. Uh, in, 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 geographic, uh, in geographic terms, we're the 40th largest country in the world. Population-wise, with 150 million, we're 11th uh, country in the world. Uh, we hold, and I think it's very important, we hold a very strategic position. And I think it's, it's interesting that Canada, United States, and Mexico all hold a strategic position, and that's the privilege of being countries that have an access both on the Pacific and on the Atlantic. So we hold both a Pacific and an Atlantic uh, uh, vocation. Uh, of course, we're the largest, uh, of course, we, we are close to the largest market. And recently, with the Canadians who were in Mexico, the parliamentarians, we said, yeah, well, you know, in, in fact, we are neighbors. Canada and Mexico's neighbor. We have a rather wide uh, frontier between us. Which is the United States, but you know, aside from this wide frontier, we're 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 neighbors, and we are in the very uh, in a, in a very uh, spiritual sense we are. Uh, we are the third largest partner to both U.S. and Canada, with China in between. Uh, trade with the United States is about a billion dollars per year. We're exporting to the United States uh, something like 350 billion dollars per year, uh, and importing about the same amount. So the the trade is you know have to close to half a half a trillion. Um, and this means that we're exporting more to the United States than all of South America combined. That is, we're exporting more to the United States uh, than Brazil, Argentina, and the whole of South America. Uh, and with Canada, the figures, I think, are very, are very, are very close to that. Um, uh, another obviously basic uh, strategic element is, I think, the, the, the very large number of Mexicans that are living in the United States. I think that, that was a very, as not recognized as a, as, a, as a geopolitical factor. I think they played a very important role in the elections. I think um, people of Mexican origin are about the same as the total Canadian population. We have about 30 million or thereabouts uh, Mexicans of, of Amer Americans of Mexican origin, plus uh, the, the actual uh, migration uh, figures, whether they're legal or, or legal or illegal, but we're there in, in, in the order of you know, uh, over 10 million. 10 million people. Uh, so I think, you know, I was, I was commenting in, in, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Canadians, obviously it was a, a, bi a binational delegation, and we mentioned, I think it, we can consider in, in, some, in some time in, in the long term that there should be, a, one could envisage the idea that North America, uh, the North American continent, could in fact be, uh, you know, a trilingual, a trilingual continent. Uh, so I think it's had, and if you go to the historic area, there was a point in time in which actually New France, New Spain and New England actually had shared borders. Um, the Mexican uh, growth model is, is not, and I think one can see it in, in Latin America, there's two countries which, uh, which deal particularly with a uh, resource-based growth development models, basically Brazil and Argentina. I think Mexico leads really a manufacturing growth model, which I think is not easily understood. 
80% uh, of our exports are manufacturing products, but at the same time, uh, we have also an export base. Obviously, and, and with, the, with Canadian participation, Mexican participation, we're now again, like in colonial times, the first producer of gold, sorry, first producer of silver, and fourth producer of gold, that's Mexican and Canadian companies working in Mexico. And if you take a range of 20 uh, important agricultural products, the main exporter to Canada is either the United States or Mexico. In some elements, it's Peru. But to give an example, I myself was surprised. Mexico is the first exporter of berries to Canada. Obviously, we export berries in the winter when you can no longer produce berries. But we, we, help, along, we help along on that. Um, let me avoid, let me mention, uh, I cannot avoid it, it's obviously, I would like to avoid it, but we cannot avoid it, and I will, and it's, you know, I will not avoid it. Uh, the drug, violence, and organized crime element. It's, it's, it's a recent, it's a recent, uh, it's a recent feature. Uh, uh, it's a, probably a feature that has developed over the last uh, 10 years, uh, maybe uh, particularly six, the, the last six years. I remember, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago when one of my sons actually came to well, probably more than 30 years ago, but I, I will not say exactly when. Anyway, one of my sons came to study in, in Carleton College, Ottawa. And, and he came to Carleton College, Ottawa to study uh, in high school. At the time, it was very fashionable that, me that Mexicans would, you know, middle class uh, Mexicans would send their, their boys to study, boys and girls to study in Canadian schools. Because basically, they considered that, uh, you know, if they, if they went to, an American, to American high schools, you know, there would be a drug problem. And in Canada, there was no drug problem. And uh, the Canadians were very, it was a good right in between, you know, some of the best advantages of the Americans, not all of the defects, some of the best qualities of the British, and none of those defects, also the French. So they, they came here. Actually, for the last 10 years, uh, uh, for the last 10 years, a very prestigious uh, think tank in Mexico, the CIDE, uh, over the course of 10 years, they, they made, uh, they have made uh, uh, poll reports. And the, the, the country that's most popular in Mexico, uh, as a country and as a, as a people, the Canadians, were number one. Number one during those, during those 10 years. Some of the equipped is because we don't know you enough, but anyway, that's, that was just the quip. I think, I think you, absolutely deserve, you absolutely deserve first place for the reasons that, that, that I mentioned. Uh, later, there's a little obstacle, which I will not mention until the end, but that's, that has altered this first place that you have. But uh, going back to the, the question of the drugs, and, uh, uh, obviously, uh, this became a problem in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, one of the very basic problems is that Americans were successful in stopping the, the inflow of drugs from the, from, the, from the sea, particularly from the Caribbean. When they stopped that, then Mexico became uh, a thoroughfare, uh, a road for many of the, of the drugs coming from, uh, coming from South America. Um, it's clear that, that in, in the drug war, I think, uh, unfortunately, it's a tragedy. I think more than 60,000 60, Mexicans have been killed in the drug war. Uh, I would say immediately that it's mostly uh, in wars between the cartels uh, themselves. There's a very vicious fight between the different cartels who are fighting for the entry points, the five or six basic entry points in the United States. And when you see that they're killing each other in Juarez or in, or in Tijuana or in Matamoros, it's actually they're killing themselves to get uh, into the US, uh, into the US uh, market. That's obviously there are some uh, policemen and military that are killed, but that's, that's where most of the, of the problem is. You can imagine that it's a serious problem when, you, when the cost of producing heroin in Colombia is $2, is $2 uh, per, I suppose, for per ounce, yeah, uh, $2, where? In the U.S. market, in the European market, is hundred dollars per ounce, so it's it's difficult to combat that. Uh, we we sell drugs, and the Americans sell us weapons. To give you an example, uh, in the in the narrow border between the United States and Mexico, well, it's not narrow; it's a very long border. But but in the narrow fringe, uh, there are ten thousand stores, which uh, which are weapons stores. Uh, I assure you, those ten thousand stores in the Mexico-U.S. border are not selling shot shotguns to to kill deer or duck, they are selling AK-47s. And that's what they're selling there. And it's so you, we export drugs and they export weapons. Um, I have been discussing a lot of this. And it's, 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 not, it's not dissimilar to the, to the opium wars that, that, the, that the British had in, you know, in, the, in the Far East. It's not dissimilar to the participation in the Vietnam War of heavy drug trafficking involving, involving you know, high personnel. Uh, so it, they're very powerful interests. Uh, I think that now the government has changed the strategy. Initially, it was, you know, it was a very serious problem. The government, the previous government, declared war on the cartels. They took the, 
They had to take the army out, in, out into the streets. And now the government's following a different strategy. It's prevention, it's intelligence, it's technology, uh, and, and, and it's, uh, uh, you're working on the young people to give them jobs, to give them health, uh, to give them employment. And I think there, there is a, obviously the idea. I think that we, we have not taken the position there, but I think it's not something that we can solve on our own. So I think there's a need for international debate on the interna international, in the, the, the depenalization of, of, of drugs. But anyway, that's a debate, and we have not taken the position on that. The transformation of, of Mexico as a second, as a second, uh, as a second topic. Uh, uh, well, there have been very strong changes in Mexico in the last 20 years. After the, what's called the last American lost decade of the 80s, uh, which was related basically to, uh, to a sovereign debt crisis and bad economic fundamentals. Recently, and I, I think Uria, uh, who was Minister of Finance at the time, has been approached to the, to the Europe by the Europeans, and they are told, Uria, uh, we would like to have your technical assistance because now we're dealing with both the problems that you were dealing with. And that was the, the need to get back to right economic fundamentals and the need to introduce structural reforms. I think we did both, and that helped us very much, and I think it's the type of thing that one is commenting that the Europeans or some Europeans uh, should do. Uh, in those structural reforms, Mexico underwent large-scale privatization. We had something like you know, more, uh, more than 1,000 public sector enterprises that went from oil or telephones to production of bicycles and even tacos. There was a, actually a taco, which is a public sector enterprise. I think 1,000 enterprises have been, were, were more than 1,000 enterprises were privatized. We opened up the banking system. Uh, particularly after the 94 crisis, open up banking system to, to, foreign, uh, to foreign participation, uh, Mexican and foreign participation. We deregulated the sector. Uh, our, can, our banking system, as the Canadian banking system, after the two, well, you, you withstood the, well, we, 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 uh, the Mexican banking system, like the Canadian banking system, withstood very well the 2008 crisis. We didn't, on the hat, we didn't have any banking crisis. Uh, and so the banking sector is solid, it's well capitalized. On the democratic process, uh, we've been really going a, a process of, of democratic or, or democracy transformation. Um, opposition parties have been gaining strong position in the state governments and in the legislative levels. Uh, in 2000, there was a crowning point for the, for the opposition. I think we certainly welcome that. The PRI was defeated for the first time in 65 years. Maybe we thought the PRI will never relinquish the power peacefully. It would relinquish the power very peacefully. The PAN went into the, the right of center party, went into the government, and for 12 years the PAN uh, was in power. Uh, the PRI was in the headlines, and now, uh, end of last year, the PRI went, again was voted back uh, into the government. President Peña has embarked in a process of reforms. Uh, we had a problem not uncommon to many other countries, that there was no since uh, 1997, the PRI no longer had majority in parliament, uh, and therefore was very, it, could, it could not pass an energy or a fiscal reform because it did not have a majority. After 2000, the PAN had a, uh, didn't have had a, a president, but no majority. And again, it was very difficult for the PAN to put forward uh, basic reforms. It, it did many other things. For example, the budget was approved un by unanimity, but it had problems in, in, in getting the, the, the major, the, the, the difficult reforms. So President Peña started with a mechanism that's now hailed probably as a, as a, you know, a, a politically interesting innovation. It, it started off with a pact for Mexico. The Pact for Mexico, they discussed for, for a long time, the three major parties, the center, the right, and the left, uh, a substantive program of action uh, to embark upon large-scale political reforms. Uh, they got the message, which other countries have not got the message, that, that political paralysis you know, was, was, that, was doing them damage, and that you know, uh, and political dysfunctionality was really causing havoc in the prestige of the politicians. So therefore, they engaged in this party, uh, the, in, this, in this pacto, and with the Pacto, they have since introduced a labor reform. That was the first one. That basically entailed uh, the, the labor market in Mexico. Again, like many perhaps European countries, was we, ha we have a welfare state. So with a welfare state, you know, people were reluctant to hire a worker who, when you hired him, immediately had to pay social security benefits, pension benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they, they did, they, they, it, was a, it was this incentive to hire workers. So now what they've done in the labor market is it's, it's easier to hire workers. The young people in particular were, were penalized. So now the young, people can, can, uh, uh, the young people can be hired as an apprentice 
for a, a probation period, or, or workers, you know, in the light of the economic cycle, can be hired per hour. Or and the, and the severance and the and the uh, it's, it's easier to hire, and uh, unfortunately also easy, easier to to uh, easier to hire, easier to fire. Telecommunications before. Uh, it's, it's really a process which in sometimes the president has gone with the right and another one has gone with the left. It was extremely unpopular that, the, uh, that in Mexico uh, we had a public sector monopoly which was Telefonos de Mexico. It was, it was a public sector monopoly who owned the telephone company all over the country. Nobody could participate. They were privatized the telephones, that's one of the things that was privatized. Who, got, who won the privatization? It was, as you know, Mr. Carlos Slim. So what happened is we, 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 privat, we privatized and we went to a public sector monopoly to a private sector monopoly. And Mr. Slim became the second wealthiest person in the world. So that's why pri privatization has to be done with great, with great care. The other, the other very much opposed, that's not a monopoly, it's a duopoly. And you have Televisa and TV Azteca, the only two television channels, and one is also open to, uh, to other uh, television channels. I, however, in that area, do not see, and that again, one common element with, with Canada. I think we also defend the cultural exception. I don't see, I don't see, uh, I don't see uh, uh, ABC or CBS getting a television channel in Mexico. That I think won't happen. It will be open to the to the private sector to participate in that. Uh, an education reform was done. Uh, Mexico acknowledges that we have a. Uh, it's, it's really a, an effort, uh, the education effort that Mexico did since the, since the 20s. It was basically a crusade to analphabetize to uh, the, whole, the whole country. Teachers did a stupendous job. When I was in the OECD, I somewhat commented the type of problems that the developing country faces. Uh, in Mexico, every six years you have six million people uh, born, well, born and they, they move. So every, every six years, six million people. And the, so I told him, the problem of a developing or emerging country is that every six years, not only schools, but hospitals and roads, we really had to construct a completely, new a completely new whole country from the point of view of infrastructure and services of the size of Belgium or Switzerland. So that was the effort that was, that was done. But unfortunately, equality is disastrous. Um, we qualify in the OECD in the so-called PISA, PISA tests. And there, you know, Brazil and Chile and Colombia were, you know, in the 50, we're, you know, 47, 48, and 49. Very low standards of quality in basic education, the ability to read, to write, and to, and to make mathematics. So we went into an education before. That's causing a great problem because there are something like 7,000. We have the largest trade union syndicate in Latin America, 1.2 million teachers. There's a dissident group of maybe 10,000. They have succeeded in blocking the streets of Mexico for a long time. They wanted to provoke the government. The, the government did not fall into this uh, uh, provocation. Uh, but these seven, 10,000 teachers, are, which come, by the way, from the poorest states of Mexico, uh, basically what they're resisting are things, elementary things, which I don't think that's elementary. Like, you know, in, in the teaching, this, this teacher's thing, you know, the workings in the 20s, very, they, they started to inherit the jobs. So, you know, it was the grandfather was a teacher, then without any qualification, the son was a teacher, and the granddaughter was a teacher. So that was obviously changed. They don't like that. You know, they think it's, you know, why, why can we cannot inherit teaching jobs? And the one thing is that we have to assess teachers. That's an evaluation of teachers. Uh, and, and again, if you evaluate students, I think the teachers should be assessed. Obviously, they resist the benchmarking or the evaluation of teachers. And obviously, it was said, if you leave classes for a month, you get fired. These teachers basically from the poorest states have been not giving classes. They've been camping out in Mexico City and have not given classes to very poor children for one or two or two years. Uh, the government will now embark on two, on two uh, major reforms. One is a political reform. Again, that's a very heavy weight reform because Mexico uh, had resisted re-election, all sorts of re-election. Uh, it was very important that, you know, because we had a, a, a president in the, from 1870 to nine, nine, 1876 to 1910 that, that lasted in power uh, 35 years. Uh, Porfirio Diaz, who not, I will say in many other words was a good president, he was in power for 35 years. The revolution started uh, effective voting and no re-election. So it, on, at the presidential level, it's absolutely forbidden. That will never change. I, well, never, you know, you never say never, but I think that's not in the dice. Uh, six-year presidential period, but what's happening, and there's a big pressure by the uh, pol politi political scientists to have re-election for deputies, uh, deputies and senators uh, up to 12 years to make them more accountable 
for their, for their work. Uh, now, the other big reform, uh, I would probably, maybe in the questions I will comment on this. Um, the, other, um, uh, the, other big, the other big reform is the, is the energy reform. That's a huge, that's a huge reform. Uh, essentially, it's, it's, it's changing something that goes back many decades, and that's eliminating the exclusivity of the Mexican state exercised through Pemex. The exclusivity on only Pemex could do drilling, production, uh, distribution, uh, uh, petrochemicals and refining. And that if this uh, constitution reform passes, which I think will pass from now until the end of the year, it requires a two-thirds majority. I think that's over. We have to look into the secondary law, but I think that will enable, that will be huge, I think, for Canadian and, and, and American participation because they will be able to, to participate uh, in, in, in two areas, which I will comment briefly lately. Uh, relationship uh, relationship with Canada. Well, uh, I think certainly the relationship with Canada, they, they are not new. We say that the first, the first background to the North American free, tre free Trade Treaty were the monarch butterflies. The monarch butterflies fly from Canada to Mexico. They're just doing that now, and they go back. In the binational parliamentary meeting, that was the, the major, and it says North America with the butterflies you know, moving from, from, uh, Can from Canada uh, to Mexico. Uh, the First Nations, I've been very surprised, I've been traveling a wise, long, important way through Canada, and I'm extremely struck, uh, particularly with, your, with the great art that you have on the Pacific coast, and there you have the masks. The masks of the, of the different uh, tribes, I know that there's a tribe called the Haita, there are others that are difficult to pronounce, and I say we're in an equal footing, to pronounce the Kawakwakwas or something like that, a uh, tribe in the Pacific to pronounce uh, uh, Teotihuacan, they're equally difficult, but uh, it, but it's the same art. And, and we're thinking for the 70th anniversary to put a back-to-back -back exposition, Canadian masks and Mexican masks of essentially the same people that were moving down the Pacific. And certainly some of them were looking some warm climate than the height has found in British Columbia. So I think that's understandably. But you find all sorts of, of, of interesting things. Uh, uh, Captain Narvaez, in 1788, uh, a Mexican sailor, still operating uh, under the Spanish colonial flag. Uh, Captain Narvaez sailed from San Blas on the Pacific coast, not far away from Canadians go for summer. And Captain Narvaez was the first Westerner to travel and map, uh, and map uh, the, the Bay of Vancouver and the islands around Vancouver. He explored them and mapped them out. Uh, it, since Spain and, 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 and England for that brief period after this was done, they were in peace terms. Captain Narvaez uh, provided Captain Vancouver uh, with the maps. So, but I could say it could be, it, it could equally, uh, Vancouver could either be Vancouver Island or Narvaez Island. But anyway, that's historical. Uh, you saw all, all sorts of in interesting things. Uh, some, uh, uh, an important uh, entrepreneur from Vancouver, uh, uh, Frederick Pearson, uh, uh, he went to Mexico. He discovered very strong hydraulic uh, uh, dams, uh, uh, and so he said, let's, let's, he did a hydroelectric dam. From that, it established the light and power, uh, light and power company in Mexico uh, in, in, in uh, you know, in the early part of the, of the century. And the Mexican light and power, Canadian and British company, operated uh, really until 1960. In 1960, uh, a Mexican president nationalizes the Mexican light and power, by the way, exactly or almost exactly the same year in which Hydro-Quebec is nationalized. So, you know, it's, it, happened at the same, it happened at the same time. But this company started the Mexico City Trolley. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting uh, things. Um, we established Japan. Uh, the, 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 the Mexican foreign policy history is, I think, quite, quite interesting. Uh, in 1988, Mexico established with Japan a treaty of full reciprocal rights which no other country had given Japan. The Japanese still recall that in 1988, we were the first country to establish a treaty with the Japanese with full historical rights. In terms of political social asylum, in, 19, in the 1920s, something like 30, 40,000 Mennonites went from Canada to Mexico. A Mexican president gave him a decree, which they could not obtain elsewhere, giving a decree whereby they could do, follow their own rules as to marriage, they could follow their own educational system, and obviously they were exempt from the army. Um, that's an interesting. The other, in, in, in terms of sort of a, a, a foreign policy that's been, I think, very, very special, I think, in the, in the best sense of the term, 
Mexico supported the Spanish Republic all the way. Uh, 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 and when, when the Spanish Republic, as the democratically elected government of Spain, fell, we gave asylum to many members of the Spanish Republic, members of the cabinet, who were received in Mexico, and they really contributed very much to our educational system. There were many lawyers who, who, who came, for example, to Mexico. Um, and there was a, a famous Mexican consul who, under Vichy France, operating out of Marseille, was putting out of was putting out through Marseille Spanish Republican refugees and to an important extent also Jewish refugees to Mexico. He was eventually imprisoned by the German, uh, the German Nazi government. Um, so we were at, at the time of the Chilean coup d'etat, uh, and Mexico has normally not gone to the issue of recognizing, you know, we don't recognize or don't recognize governments, we think that's not done. We suffered that from much. We, we simply maintain the right to establish relations with whom we want. After the uh, Allende, uh, after the uh, after NFO, we again received very important people from the academic and teaching distinguished Chilean intellectuals who came to Mexico, including the widow of Allende. Uh, interestingly, also, uh, together with Canada, we were the first, uh, together with Canada, we were the two, the two only countries in the Western Hemisphere to recognize the Castro regime. We did so at the beginning. I think it was on the, on the uh, Prime Minister de Fingenbacher's government and, and the Mexican president. We recognize the Castro regime, and we are the only two countries from the beginning and maintain diplomatic relations all the time. Uh, Mexico played a role together with Colombia, the Central American republics, supported by Canada, to pacify Nicaragua during the time of the Civil, Civil War. And at the Security Council, we did not support the invasion of Iraq. Uh, leaks with Canada are considerable. I mentioned that after NAFTA, NAFTA was by no means a foregone conclusion. Uh, I speak with both Canadian entrepreneurs and Mexican, in fact, I'm a friend of the Mexican ambassador, who, Alfredo Phillips, whom you might know. And initially, there was many people in Canada who thought, oh, it's a nuisance to go to a free trade treaty uh, with Mexico. We already have a free trade treaty with, with the Americans. Uh, but there was really a, a large number of public and private sector enlightened Canadians who thought it was going to be a good idea to join the, to join the table with the Americans and to make a free trade treaty. I think they were proved right by events. As I mentioned, we're the, th the third trading partner in trade, second source of tourism, and there were 1.7 million Canadians who visited Mexico. To put this in perspective, each of the major cities, Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal sent to Mexico 300,000 <coughs> tourists. To put that in perspective, each city, each of those 300 south are the total number of tourists that come from Spain as a whole, with whom we obviously have a good. And the, the foreign investment relationship is extraordinary. I think one of the best examples there is anywhere of good foreign direct investment that fulfills what it should fulfill is the case of Bombardier Querétaro. They started to establish uh, an aerospace industry, and, and they started it on their, on their own. Now Bombardier has, uh, around Bombardier in the city of Querétaro, you have something like 40 firms from all over the country, including French uh, airplane or, tele or helicopter companies that are working there. Canada is always very important in mining, as I, as I already mentioned. And Canada, Mex United States, and Mexico were extremely important in, in, in the automobile uh, industry. I think Mexico is right out of the big leagues, uh, together with Canada, United States, Japan, Korea, in the, in the production of automobiles. I think the relationship has now reached a certain plateau, and now I think that, that, that we have to, uh, uh, I think we have to, to revive that. There's a high plateau, but we have to, and that's part of, my, of our job here, is to, you know, it's, it's a good potential, high potential, let's, let's, let's move it. Uh, I think that uh, there's, a new, there's a new strategy, and a new strategy in which we're working very heavily with the Canadian government, the Canadian parliamentarians, uh, and obviously with the, with the American government and, the, and, and Canadian uh, and American firms, is I think that we want to establish North America as a concept, North America as a concept, as a, as a, as a, as a region that grows fast and becomes very, very competitive, but as a region. Uh, that does not mean that we exclude uh, relations with other countries. Mexico already had, many years ago, a free trade treaty with Europe. We're delighted that you also have a treaty with Europe, that the Americans will have it. But I think, I think we start from a base, and the base is North America. And I think we're also uh, in the TPP negotiation with you. We are also, we have a negotiation for a tre free treaty with China. We have an excellent relation with China. So I think it's not exclusive. But I think what we're saying is that what, what has changed? I think there is a really a fantastic energy revolution. 
Uh, it's an energy revolution as a result of new technology, both the deep water oil discoveries in the Gulf of Mexico and the new technologies of fracking uh, in the, of shale gas in the Texan basis uh, will make, and that's a big change, the U.S. Be, will become uh, a net, uh, eventually, a net, very quickly, a net gas exporter and also a net oil importer. Now, the interesting thing uh, uh, about this is, first, we can work on, a, on, a, on the grid of pipelines crossing throughout the whole of North America. Uh, uh, we wish you luck in the, in the Keystone project. I think it's necessary. Uh, I think there's also the East-West pipeline. But Mexico is having also its own grid linking both uh, to the west of Mexico and to the east of Mexico. A Canadian company that's Transcan has already in place contracts or you know, win, win some biddings to develop five new pipelines. Uh, and those five new pipelines signify it's not insignificant, 2,000 kilometers and a two billion investment. Uh, we, we are very short at present in gas. Uh, the, ducts, the, the pipelines are completely saturated. Uh, so, um, you know, we need, we need more pipelines to get gas. To. We have the ridiculous situation in which we're producing uh, energy, uh, electric energy, out of oil or carbon, uh, which is not only dirty, but it's very, very expensive. Since we didn't have the pipelines, we're bringing in gas through the Pacific ports, uh, but those, those, that gas costs something like you know, $16 and $20, whereas uh, with gas uh, produced in North America, it's $4, okay? Now, uh, uh, I think that it, it, we, it, with, with gas at $4, and Mexico will now be working as a result of this energy reform, will be working in deep water perforation. Uh, the same, uh, the same uh, wealth in the Gulf of Mexico where the Americans have drilled 130 wells, we have only drilled six, but it's the same area. Out of those 130 wells, the United States has become a major oil exporter. We have the same amount of wealth. Uh, so what we need is to, there's no way, and they were told to the people in Pemex, you're crazy. No, Pemex is, a, is, is one of the five largest oil companies in the world. Uh, and still Pemex being as large as it is, it's crazy if you go drilling a deep water, deep water, uh, deep water wells, uh, which, where you have to share risk. So I think that will be opened up to foreign sector participation. And in shale gas, you have a completely different ballgame. That, that you have 90,000 wells, that the Americans have 90,000 wells in the Texas basis. You cross the Rio Grande, the same, but the Americans have drilled 90,000, and Mexico has drilled six. Uh, that's an area which I think has enormous promise. And Pemex has said, I'm not going to go into that. I don't have the capacity. I th and I mentioned in, in Calgary recently, that's a great opportunity for medium-sized uh, Canadian companies. The three of them, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, we are according to the measurement out of the, we are either uh, Canada or Mexico, fourth or fifth. Uh, uh, the United States is probably is sometimes second or first, second, or third, Canada, fourth, or fifth, or sixth. That means the three countries are amongst the six, three, of the six, three of the six largest producers of gas, of shale gas. There's no region in the world that even can remotely compare to the reservoirs of gas that these this three, three countries have. That's an enormous opportunity. It's a big geological and geopolitical change. As I mentioned, the three countries become an energy powerhouse. But producing gas at $4, it makes manufacturing extremely competitive. That means with cheap gas, the manufacturing sector and the whole industrial sector of the three countries became extremely competitive. If you add to that innovation and financial resources, as I think recently Schultz, the former minister, it's, there's no doubt about it. It's, uh, North America is a new economic powerhouse and a new energy powerhouse. Um, uh, I would like also to highlight one important that we think it's important not only to go east-west, but to go north-south. We're extremely enthusiastic about the, the Pacific Alliance. The Pacific Alliance, it's Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. It's very important because it's not, not only economic, it's also political. Uh, Costa Rica will soon be joining, I think Panama will soon be joining. Uh, Canada is a very active observer. It's a country which I think should fit there. And I think somebody wrote, it's a good fit. Canada already has free trade treaties with those four countries. 
And I think the advantage of that is that it's, a, an, it's the most dynamic area of, it's not, it's the south, the, the north south Pacific is the most dynamic area of the continent. Uh, it's countries which grow fast, they're like minded, they're open to free trade, they're democratic, uh, they change governments and they still maintain that, which is quite a different thing. We, it's an open system. We hope that our friends from the Atlantic will join us, but for the time being, it's a very homogeneous, very fast uh, growing uh, a, area. Uh, so, I, well, I have spent, uh, so one of the areas here is, you know, it's trade, we're interested in trade negotiations, and we're interested in the free. I've lasted almost, I'm bringing it at the end of the, of the conference. And I will not say the word, but at the end of the conference, I would like that we are committed to the free movement of people. These four countries, which in many ways one might consider are not easy because they have drug problems, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, and Chile established a visa-free system for the four countries recently. We did, by the way, to Brazil. So that's a word I'd like to mention. So I, what I, I probably, you know, I should not have used it, but basically I say there are only two problems between Canada and Mexico. One is a problem with a big B, a four-letter word with a big B, that's beef. We have resisted the importation of 30-month-old cattle uh, from, from mid, from mid Canada, uh, because there are problems with of, of, of sanitary, at least some risks until we're satisfied that there's no risk, uh, in importing <coughs> this beef. It's, it's <coughs> a big B problem. The other is a little B problem. The little B problem, I think that now there's a major, you know, or I would say almost overwhelming crusade, uh, in the crusade of, of, of you know, self-generated because now I think, I've been speaking with many people. The tourist people say, you know, I was in Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver would have doubled its inflow of Mexican tourists. I was told, you know, they, 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 they like very much Whistler, they're heavy spenders, you know, they, they like the snow. It would have doubled the, the number of tourists. And that's the same in mont and everywhere. We should have doubled the, name of the number of tourists. And I think it would be exponential, a uh, number of tourists. In fact, instead of doubling, it's half, half what it should be, okay? Uh, everybody tells, I cannot send Bombardier, uh, uh, you know, four seasons, you know, I want to send my mid-management to train in, 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 in Canada, I cannot do it. Uh, recently, uh, there was uh, somebody that brought in a huge Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera exhibition. He wanted to have it in, 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 in Toronto, and then he went to other cities. That was the, the, the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Uh, he was given a, a, a single entry visa for, for, for a limited period of time. His uh, curator was given a multiple entry visa. He became very angry because he was only given a single, so he canceled the, ex the exhibition. There are at least two ministers of high level of Mexico who have, one had a, a flat in Whistler and he decided to sell it because he did, refused to go to the indignity of going through the process of the information that is required. It's creating a bad image to this great image that Canada has. Uh, it's, it, it has a great image. So this is literally damaging the image of Canada in a country that's very friendly uh, to, to, to you. Uh, it's affecting business, it's affecting tourism, uh, and, uh, you know, and we absolutely need, as I mentioned, there's going to be a, a visit of Prime Minister Harper to Mexico and there's a visit of Peña to celebrate the 70th anniversary. I think we, we have gotten extremely good reactions. I think we're finally, as a result of everybody, you know, saying that this is ridiculous. Uh, I think it's, it, uh, and I will mention one thing which I completely accept. The problem was there was an abuse of the refugee asylum status and there were people that, you know, went through crooks and they came into, there's no way we don't have a political you know, repression and we don't have, a, uh, there's, it's a country that, that's, uh, you know, I think it's a free country, there's no repression of any type, except with a very limited, there's something that comes, I, I'm a refugee because my father hit me and then I have to go because I, I'm a refugee from my father who hits me on weekends, well, okay, that's a definition that he could be called a refugee, but you get that, those types of refugees. So that, that's done, okay? Now there are only 60 refugees coming from Mexico, so that was the root of the problem. Having eliminated the, the root of the problem, uh, then it's, 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 yeah, I think that we can solve the problem. I know that Canadian system, and I think we've gotten very good constructive, that you need to put in place a number of technological devices like the electronic uh, travel program, so you have, and we have to ch exchange good data, good databases so, so that, you know, it, the crooks are detected, but we, crooks don't detect the flight, the flight of people, and uh, so it's there. Uh, this time I was in Mexico, and I had enormous, enormous problems, and I mentioned 
this was raised very frankly with the parliamentarians. I had enormous problems. Uh, and I mentioned, obviously, you know, really getting uh, along well. I think we're advancing concrete solutions. We understand Canadian concerns. We will meet the Canadian concerns. I will work to solve this problem, but this problem has to be solved. Imagine me explaining, and that's with all due respect, because I'm delighted that, that some of the visa requirements have been eliminated, as we eliminated for Brazil or uh, uh, Chile. Imagine me explaining why, in terms of the requirements or the qualifications, why the Czech Republic got, uh, I know what's the reason, I won't say it, but I think you also know it, but why the Czech Republic, was, their visa was eliminated and Mexico's visa was not eliminated. And it's difficult to explain because we've been, for 20 years, your third major trading partner, uh, and, and you know, this huge flows of tourists, huge flows of business, huge flows of investment, and obviously we have, we have, a, uh, we have problems that we have to, to tackle, uh, but I think, uh, but I think it's, it's difficult to justify that we would not meet completely all the objective criteria that is met by other countries, which are delighted that they no, no longer have visas. So that's, I think, the two, the two points. The future, I think, looks very good. Uh, and that will, I will conclude, I, I think, by that. Uh, I think in the last months, I think we've gotten out of this violence, which is still there, it's a serious problem, but I think Mexico's seen a different light. Uh, recently, there's been a wave of uh, sort of uh, major newspapers. You have uh, the question of the, uh, the economy started last year, the rise of Mexico. They speak now of the Mexican Jaguar. Some of them speak of the new China. In some sense, the BRICS, uh, they are obviously very much in fashion. They're the strongest economies. But now it's the mix. And now, it's now you're, 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 you're really having uh, you know, fashion in terms of Mexico, Indonesia, Korea and Turkey as sort of you know, coming up as a, as a, as a focus for, for investors. Uh, the prospects of mutual, and we are very much analyze this within the North American concept. Uh, by Price Waterhouse or wherever, the OECD, et cetera, by the year 2030, Mexico will become the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world. That's 2030. That means Mexico, the only countries in the G7 that will be larger than Mexico will be the United States, Germany, and Japan. That's it. Among the emerging countries, China, India, and Brazil. We have together abundant energy. We have a young population when everybody's population is aging. We have a working democracy. We share the same values. We are free trade oriented. And we have good and sound economic fundamentals. Inflation, 4%. Fiscal deficit, 2, 3, 4%, about half of what's the OECD average. The level of debt is about half or a third of what the OECD, lab, uh, what the OECD uh, average has. So uh, I think that we, we share uh, a lot uh, with Canada. Uh, and I think we are very much committed, as I mentioned, to work very hard with our Canadian friends for a more active and more constructive role at the same time that Mexico is again taking a more active international role as it did uh, in the past. Thank you very much for your patience and I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> We don't have a lot of time, but for those of you who would like to ask a question, I implore you not to make a speech, just ask the question crisply. And there is a microphone here. If you're over there, you could just stand up and project. I would appreciate that very much. First question. Your Excellency, thank you. I think we all benefited a great deal from your information, your insights, your candor. May I ask you, in your role as ambassador, what would you like to see uh, as your legacy, you wish, as in, in terms of the relationship between Mexico and Canada after your time spent here? Well, uh, I, I, think, I think that's, that's obviously it's a very, very important question. Uh, as a general point, uh, I think that you know, we, I would like to, to work in really getting through this concept that it's, it's North America together, the three countries, acting to become a competitive, uh, dynamic countries. I think that's, that's, that's in a sense the vision. But the mission should not be made just of a vision. I think there are a number of three or four specific things on which we have to work. I think one very important thing is that we have to have a complementary energy policy. Uh, and that complementary energy policy is that there be a grid connecting you know, the the three, uh, the three countries, and we use uh, energy uh, not only to export abroad, but we use the energy to develop uh, a very competitive manufacturing uh, sector. 
uh, uh, in particularly well, in, in, the, in the manufacture, there are many, many areas, I think there are any productive change. So that, that working in energy. Secondly, promote participation of Canadian companies in infrastructure. I mentioned Transcam already doing pipelines, but you have, we will be developing within our new strategy, a big, uh, we're going back to railroads. Huh? And there are five large projects of railroads uh, you know, in which it would be interesting for Canadian films to participate. Again, I think we're working uh, on the idea of corridors of infrastructure which go from Mexico to Canada. Uh, not only oil, but you know, infrastructure where manufacturing and other products can travel. That's the second point, infrastructure. Third, labor mobility. Labor mobility means, I think at present, we're working very closely in that we have to, uh, we have uh, ex ex excess uh, people in the semi-skilled industries, that's carpenters, electricians, uh, uh, people in construction, I see very clearly that there are severe shortages in areas like, like Alberta, Calgary, and, uh, and we don't want to export people. I went, we want to do it exactly as what happened with the Temporary Agriculture Workers Program. It was a one-year program, again, exemplary program, because they gave social rights to, to the Mexican workers social rights of every sense, uh, social insurance, education. They were for one year and they went back. So I think that we can do that for semi-skilled workers. And we have to do the same in terms of STEM, increasing substantially the interchange of, in a, and we were talking about with the, with the, with the president of, of, of the university, that you know, we have to develop more uh, exchanges at university level, students, students who, who study and then work, uh, professors both sides that teach, uh, on, on both sides uh, to, to develop, I think, the, there are areas in which we have uh, strengths, uh, in which it would be interesting to have Canadian uh, researchers, students, and obviously you have one of the best uh, uh, innovation and research areas in the world, so I think that would be a third, uh, a third area that I think would be important. The other area, I think, is that I think uh, working so that you, you know Mexico better, uh, uh, and Canadians know better than Mexicans, Mexicans better than Canadians, and to work very closely with your very strong private sector. They were the ones that drove the government to, to sign in 94 the free trade agreement. I think there's a very large number of, of entrepreneurs. Some of them are already in Mexico, and I think one has to expand now from large companies to middle, uh, to medium-sized companies, and then you have to bring in banking and finance. Sometimes the middle-sized companies in both countries uh, don't, uh, don't have it. So, I think those, those would be, I think, uh, some of the key areas to uplift the, the, the level of our relation, energy, infrastructure, uh, labor mobility, uh, tourism. Again, tourism, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't double the number of Canadians going to Mexico. You have 1.7, which is seasonal, it's half a year. Uh, we can compete absolutely with anything that Europe has to offer. You see, you like Baroque, we have as good Baroque churches in Mexico. You like uh, pre-Columbia? Well, obviously we have pre-Columbia and the Europeans don't have it. They come to us in the summer, not only in the winter. Uh, Germans, French, to go to see our, our monuments. That, that, that's, that's very important. Um, and uh, uh, so, so, so they, they, they visit, I think, our colonial sites and, the, uh, of course, modern Mexico. We're only one of the two countries that have, uh, that have been granted the status of world heritage status. Only France, I think, maybe China and Mexico. I know, I see there's a revolution, I think there's a sort of taco revolution, everybody is, is eating, uh, it's either tacos or tequilas or mezcal, you know, but it's, it's, again, Mexican food is much more than that. So I think that that's another aspect in which we would like to work, you know, to get the Canadians to, that is a problem, there's a problem, airlines. Uh, except for charters, very few, very few uh, airlines uh, going to Mexico. So I you know it's four ambitious things, but I think the idea is raise the level of the relationship and get it a new dynamic. Ambassador Suarez, thank you so much for speaking tonight. Uh, my name is Antoine Nouvet. I'm with the SECDEF Foundation, a think tank based here in Ottawa. Okay. We do a lot of research in Latin America, an example of which I have here for you, thank you. on our Mexico research, which Good. will come out in El País this week. Yeah. Uh, I just have one question which focuses more on some of the darker issues yeah. and less positive ones. Uh, it being twofold, one of them is Mexico's narco war, which has intensified over the last 10 years, as you said. Yeah. Is it important to Canada? And if it is, what should Canada focus on doing if lending assistance to Mexico with this situation? 
Yeah. Well, I, I would say, you know, very briefly, the, the Naco war, of course, you know, the, the first country which is damaging is to Mexico, no? Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a saying that, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, we're, we're in a sense uh, putting the dead uh, for the water, for the war drugs which should be conducted by the United States. We put the dead uh, and, and you know, they, 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 they pay the money, okay? So, uh, so it's, a, it's a very serious problem for Mexico. I, might, I, might, I would immediately say against in this term of these stereotypes that the problem of drugs is, 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 is highly concentrated, as you probably know, in certain areas of the country. It's concentrated in the poorer areas of Mexico, that's the southern Pacific states, which is uh, uh, Guerrero, that's where Acapulco is, by the way, Guerrero, uh, Michoacán, very importantly Michoacán, and, and also uh, Chiapas, okay? Uh, that's, that's where the problem is. And then the other problem is, you know, the cities uh, into the United States where they fight for the distribution. One is to some extent related to production and the other is, is related to the distribution. I would say that, that this is a problem of, of security, certainly for Mexico, and it is to a certain extent to the United States, okay? Because finally it's the border there which is affected both ways. And there have been killings on both sides. And since it's a very porous border, you have there a very porous border. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of contamination that happens there. So I think, it's a, I think that, the, that the problem of war of drugs is a problem, of, uh, a border problem, a particular border problem to the United States. Uh, it's not to Canada. It's too far away. It's not to Canada. Uh, that's why, you know, problem of migration, which is an, is an important problem. The problem of migration is, is important for the United States. We have a million crossings a day, like you do Canada, United States, a million crossings a day with the United States and Mexico. So that's a, the, the migration and the flow of people is a very serious problem between the United States and Mexico. It's not for, it's not for Canada. You're simply, you know, too far away uh, and, and it's difficult that the drug problem for Mexico will go into, into Canada. Uh, I think that you require there a minimum and it's maybe the same problem that you get, you know, Mexican tra drug traffickers as you get drug traffickers from Marseille or you get uh, drug traffickers from, from Asia. But I think, I think you're, you're sheltered, I think, by, by the distance. So I think it's not a security problem. But I think it's a problem, obviously, that we have to, uh, we have to, to tackle uh, together. And I might highlight to one extent, which again, mainly a problem for us, and to a certain extent, to the United States. And that's, we have a very serious problem in some of the Central American republics, where I think the drugs have, the drug, uh, uh, the drug lords have acquired enormous power which sometimes the power of drug lords is, is higher than the power of the army or the police in certain areas. They have a, a lesser states, no? Uh, in the case of Mexico, it's a problem, but you know, uh, you know we have a, whatever, a 200,000 uh, strong military and we're building now a, a 50,000 strong police. And I think we, there's a problem in limited areas of the country, but it's not a national problem. Uh, for Central America, in some cases, it is a national problem. And I think, as I, that's why I mentioned Contadora. I think Canada, the United States, and Mexico have to work in Central America and to some extent the Caribbean to help fight the problem of drugs. And as Contadora showed, it's not a problem only of putting the military or putting the police or working at the institution building of the judiciary. We have to work at developing the region. I think we can do it. Uh, and why don't we have a problem with people coming out of Panama? Because Panama is growing 10% per year. Why isn't there a problem in Costa Rica? Because Costa Rica is a democratic country with 6% of growth per year. The countries where there's a problem is because they're not growing. So I think we have to work and say, how do we root out the problem? And that's the strategy also in Mexico. You, you attack the problem by attacking the causes of the problem. Youth employment, youth education, like. But uh, to sum up, it's not a problem for Canada. It's a problem, except in a limited sense, and to the extent that we share common problems. It's a problem certainly for the United States, and it's a problem for Mexico. Thank you. One last question. If not, uh, we will have an opportunity in a few minutes to uh, join the ambassador for at our reception when you can corner him and ask him whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I shouldn't have said it that way. Uh, it is now my pleasure to ask uh, our former Canadian ambassador, Paul Duran, he was ambassador to the OES, Costa Rica, Chile, uh, to thank our guest speaker. Uh, Excelencia, le quiero Gracias. agradecer profundamente por su excelente presentación. Uh, I think we all learned a great deal from, uh, from the ambassador's comprehensive uh, 
uh, presentation about Mexico and about Canada and Mexico relations, and we learned it from the Mexican perspective, which is most uh, much valuable. And, and this is the value of diplomatic relations and the exchange of ambassadors. And in this context, I want to say that I believe that Canada is very, very fortunate that uh, Mexico named someone of your stature and qualifications to be ambassador here. Uh, your experience in the financial sector at the OECD, at the IMF, uh, the Banco de Mexico, and uh, also your experience, your political experience in the Congress are surely going to serve you very well and serve us well uh, also. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the other qualifications, and that's the tennis skills you bring to our group every Saturday morning. <laughs> I notice there are quite a few tennis players out here. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the first time I've seen them wearing real clothes. <laughs> it's the same about me. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the visa problem, Ambassador, and uh, I think that uh, you're in good company there, because most Canadians recognize that this system is dysfunctional, it's broken, and it has to be fixed. Uh, fortunately, I think that we're on the way to doing that, and I really hope that uh, it will be resolved very soon. So, um, I just want to thank you again, Ambassador, for that uh, wonderful presentation, and uh, wish you all the best of success in your time here, and we have a small token of our appreciation for you. Forward seeing in the tennis court. Yes. And the other thing I, I you know, mentioned is yes, as long as there is Canadian wine. There will be Canadian wine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought we were getting Mexican wine. <laughs> Please join us in the other room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.